Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for April 24th, 2023. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is cybersecurity operations for the NSF Access Cyber Infrastructure with Derek Simmel. Derek is a Senior Information Security Officer at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions um, during the presentation or we'll set aside time for questions as well. And with that, I'll hand things over to Derek. Derek, welcome. Good morning, thank you very much. Let me get my slides together here. All right. Share that. Hopefully everybody can see my slides. All right. Yep, they look good. Great, uh, thank you very much. I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with the Access uh, Project, it is uh, a follow-on to the TerraGrid and XSEED NSF cyber infrastructure projects that uh, enable access by the nationwide, albeit worldwide community um, to NSF sponsored high performance computing centers and other resources around the country. Um, access took over for XSEED uh, officially after September 1st, although the project actually started uh, back in May of last year. Um, and we worked very hard, uh, as you will soon see, um, to enable a smooth transition of the many thousands of users that were in XSEED over into Access. My name is Derek Simmel. I am co-PI co and cybersecurity lead for Access Connect. Uh, Connect is one of um, the tracks in Access, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, as I mentioned, uh, NSF Access um, covers the uh, projects that are allocated to um, provide allocations of time and resources on high performance computing uh, systems and storage and uh, networking resources. Uh, there's a support project. Um, there's an operations project, which is where my part of the, uh, the game lies. And there's a metrics project that measures um, performance and does analytics and provides feedback to the project as well as to the community uh, about um, how systems are working and, and what's going on with them. We also have an access coordination office, um, which does not rule the others. Uh, it is a, a collaborative partner in the project, and their, their role is to make sure that communications between the four um, NSF projects that comprise access uh, work well and that the outreach to the community is also um, smooth. Within uh, track three, which is operations, uh, we call this uh, project Connect uh, for core national ecosystem for cyber infrastructure. Tim Borner is our PI and uh, for operational support, uh, which includes technology in integration operations and information sharing, we have JP Navarro and Winona Snapchilds leading us. For networking and data transfer support, we have Dave Wheeler and Kathy Benninger leading that effort. Uh, I'm currently just leading the cybersecurity support area by myself. Normally we have co-PIs in this area, but unfortunately, um, our, my co-lead co was recruited away and, and is uh, off starting a new position as of a few weeks ago. So we'll be uh, filling that position hopefully soon. Uh, we have found that having um, a pilot and co-pilot in all of these leadership uh, positions is really helpful and helps us uh, do that. And I will say also that in the broader impacts area, which includes student training and engagement, and ensuring that we're doing our best for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Winona Snap Charles is um, leading that effort. Um, project leadership, again, Tim Borner. Um, Leslie Froschel is our project director. Tom Maiden uh, from PSC uh, coordinates uh, with uh, resource providers. So if you hear 
uh, acronyms like RP, that means resource provider, those are the, the sites uh, that are uh, providing HPC systems, storage resources, might could even be an instrument, uh, anything that basically ties in to the infrastructure that is provided by Access Cyber Infrastructure um, counts as a resource. Um, I'm the cybersecurity lead at the moment. Um, JP takes care of operations together with Winona Snapchilds. And we've got Dave and Kathy, as I mentioned earlier, for networking and data support. The mission, um, this is the official stated mission, uh, is to advance the cyber infrastructure ecosystem. Um, we This focuses in three main areas, operations that ties everything that is the access uh, project together uh, across all the tracks. It's uh, network and, and data movement and it's cybersecurity and also um, has an area in development of a cyber infrastructure professional workforce. So we do actually have uh, a training uh, and development area that is a, a part of our project. Um, again, our goal is to provide a, a stable network uh, to lead in cybersecurity um, and provide a reliable ecosystem so that everybody who needs to get to the HPC systems that are allocated uh, can do so um, as easily and as uh, efficiently as possible. Um, we make sure that we're providing the resource providers with the kind of instructions they need for hooking into the, um, the infrastructure and ecosystem and networks and any of the management and instrumentation that we want to, to have uh, available so that we can monitor the performance of the entire ecosystem. Um, we want to deliver some core services. Um, identity and access management comes to mind, certainly from cybersecurity. Um, we want to look for new ways we can be more inclusive, not only of the diversity of the population, but also in the diversity of resources. There are always new data sets and uh, new instruments and new high performance computing systems coming online. And um, we want to figure out how to make them available and make them accessible. Uh, through the NSF cyber infrastructure. And along the way, we hope to build ne the next generation of, of uh, cyber infrastructure operators and to uh, figure out how to do that training and how to do that mentoring and, and so forth. So step is the student training and, uh, and um, oh dear, student training and uh, uh, experience program, I believe. Um, that's the one that uh, Winona Snapchilds is leading to, and she's got a, um, a first step program starting uh, next month. We have enrolled a number of students from all over the country, and they will start with a sort of a boot camp, uh, followed by an internship. And then in uh, the third part of that program, they'll be um, actually um, interning remotely uh, throughout the year uh, with um, members of the project to uh, learn about and, and learn to be cyber infrastructure um, developers and operators and um, professionals. In operational support, um, we're basically trying to make sure that everything works cleanly. We're trying to provide the instructions necessary for um, resource providers to uh, hook into the infrastructure. We're also making sure that the other tracks uh, get the information services, the authentication and authorization information they need uh, the, to to operate and, and, and stay in sync with the rest of us. In data and networking, uh, there is a, a national uh, network uh, for um, resource providers to hook into. And in cybersecurity, we're trying to keep it safe and keep the hackers out. So uh, we're also um, owning and operating the registration, the user registration, identity, and access management part of that. Uh, ConnectNet, the, the network uh, which uh, succeeded the uh, ExceedNet is a layer three VPN uh, provisioned on top of internet two. Um, it is instrumented for uh, performance management, uh, but it is also uh, intended to provide uh, in a sort of a hub and spoke model uh, places for sites to hook into, um, resource providers to gain their uh, high-speed networking access and for 
uh, remote participants to be able to get on with their own internet to or other uh, NREN connections into uh, the ecosystem. Within cybersecurity, uh, our goals are governance and oversight. Uh, we define um, policies uh, for acceptable operation and, and secure computing. And we uh, coordinate that across all the access tracks and the resource providers. And we uh, set policies for um, researchers who are our users in the ecosystem. Uh, we inventory and, and monitor threats and, and uh, manage our risks accordingly. We uh, operate authentication services. We prepare and um, monitor as well as uh, keep our ears to the ground, if you will, in cybersecurity community readiness. So that's not just incident uh, re response, but it's also preparing to deal with incidents when they occur up front by establishing the relationships we need and building the trust that we need within the entire community um, to ensure that when we have to respond, we can do so well. Um, and we're also trying to uh, get the word out. So training about cybersecurity, keeping people aware of the kinds of threats and the kinds of um, reasons and, and uh, that they should participate with us uh, as part of the community to assure the um, integrity, the, uh, you know, the cybersecurity of their data and their research. A new area that uh, we're getting into in access is really trying to take advantage of services and investments made by NSF and others um, to uh, share what we learn with the broader community and to learn from the broader community what, uh, based on the data that they have, what we should be watching out for. So federated intelligence sharing uh, is going to be very important. We've just started on that uh, on that. Uh, track and we'll be um, I'll be mentioning that a little bit later and then um, a big from a service perspective um, we really um, are investigating better ways to do authentication and identity um, I'll get into the details later but uh, one of the main things that we wanted to try and do is make sure that we were uh, adopting modern um, web-centric and internet-centric uh, uh, protocols and APIs and, um, you know, not leaving ourselves uh, stuck in, in uh, uh, legacy stuff that wasn't serving us anymore. The support team, uh, there are 13 of us on staff at the moment. Uh, myself, Shane, and Hawa are from PSC. Jim Basney, who leads Trusted CI, uh, is our identity and access management lead. And um, from NCSA, we also have Chris Klaus and Terry Fleury, Jacob Gallian, and Ryan Walker. Uh, from the San Diego Supercomputer Center, we have Scott Sakai and Brian Holm helping us out. Uh, Scott is working on uh, various technology and, and uh, risk management issues. And from Florida International University, we have Javier Franco joining us. Uh, and from OmniSoc and Indiana University, we have Susan Sons and Adrian, Adrian Crenshaw. We had some milestones we had to establish some for the project. Um, these were fairly high high level. Um, first and foremost, we needed to set up a cybersecurity um, system, uh, if you will, and we adopted a trusted CY framework to guide us and to make sure that we were dot dotting the I's and crossing the T's and making sure that um, we weren't leaving things uh, open and, and un uncovered. Um, we wanted to refine the access cybersecurity program by, by developing the policies necessary to govern all the different aspects that we need. Uh, we've made uh, great progress on that in the first year. Um, and we also wanted to formalize guidelines for resource providers. You know, what are the road rules for working with access and how do you integrate uh, and keep uh, in with cybersecurity policies so that we can all kind of have at least the same playing field that we're working on here. Uh, so we did develop the core cybersecurity policies for access. We created a cybersecurity governance council. So um, you really can't get buy-in as we all know uh, uh, without um, working hard to establish relationships and making sure that everybody feels that they are being heard 
and so we established a governance council that has as its voting members uh, representatives from each of the access um, funded tracks from uh, NSF. And uh, we also invite resource providers to participate on that council. Uh, the council's job is to um, basically review and uh, communicate out and to receive feedback in to help us develop policies that everybody can live with. Um, a great deal of the effort in the first year was in the building and deployment of a comprehensive identity and access management infrastructure and new user registration system. Uh, Co-manage uh, was used for that. Uh, that's the in common um, open source registry uh, software together with, um, again, another Jim Basley project, uh, a CI log on authentication and for multi-factor authentication when we're employing Duo. Uh, we have deployed an active vulnerability scanning and management system, and we have also convened and continued from X, uh, from EXE, the Incident Response and Trust Group, which is represented by uh, members from all the resource providers and other friends of the uh, NSF cyber infrastructure who have been with us over the many years, even if they're not uh, full-time resource providers anymore. We, we don't... Uh, we don't shoo anybody away. If you've been in our community, uh, especially in cybersecurity, we, we welcome your participation. The Trusted CI Framework, uh, our host today, thank you very much, um, provides uh, what's called a minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. And I was reminded the other day, people, I don't want people to take that the wrong way. This is not a low standard by any means. Uh, as those who have uh, adopted the framework understand, this is a standard above which one must comply to be successful. So it, it sets a good bar um, and it is very comprehensive and we're very glad to have it available uh, to pin all the needs that we have in access for our cybersecurity program. Uh, there are pillars in the Trusted CI framework and uh, examples of where uh, we have uh, done work this year in mission alignment. We've identified the assets and stakeholders. Um, we've added the assets to an ongoing uh, service index that is live and, and you can look it up and I'll show you a little bit of that right uh, right quick now, as they say, and real, real soon now. Um, in terms of governance, we have established a cybersecurity governance council and that reports and delivers policies to the executive council. That's the overall governing um, PIs, if you will, group uh, for access. And the executive council actually, um, at the end of uh, policy development, they, they actually ratify it. So it doesn't actually become a policy until the executive council signs off on it. Uh, but all the development happens uh, in coordination with the other tracks and with the resource providers. Um, we have budgeted for cybersecurity, which is good, and we have um, resources to protecting the assets. Those are those are in the the um, in the budget, and and we are using that to to uh, establish controls and and uh, um, monitoring, scanning, you name it, and reporting. Uh, we have established controls. We have a, a baseline set of security standards that we have established and um, we require RPs to, to adopt that, uh, if not, uh, but you know it was also developed in concert with them. So it's not something we're imposing entirely on them. And we do realize that the framework is a continuous process. Uh, you know, security is always a continuous improvement process and, uh, but this gives us the foundation on which to build that in access. Uh, I think I pretty much covered this. The, the Cybersecurity Governance Council, the CGC, we call it, um, it works uh, with the Executive Council to establish uh, policies. Um, and it also works to communicate the cybersecurity information out to the access uh, tracks in the coordination office. Um, we meet every other week. Uh, we have representatives. Uh, and again, it's a communication coordination get everybody on board, um, work out all the, the tough details and, and uh, take the feedback from the, the tracks and the RPs and, and fold it into policies that we can all live with. Among the policies that we've established this year, the core information security policy, again, the baseline security standards I mentioned earlier, 
an acceptable use policy and a privacy policy. Those are the, if you will, the researcher facing ones. Um, we have an identity and access management policy that governs uh, how identities and the uh, various infrastructure and APIs are used. We have a vulnerability management policy. We expect people and ourselves as well as our, our stakeholders to, to, to patch on a timely basis and, and uh, keep their systems secure. And we have an incident response policy which establishes, if you will, the kind of playbook for um, what to do, who to communicate, who not to communicate with in the event of an incident and uh, how we manage that when incidents do occur. These templates uh, that we used were from Trusted CI and we found them to be um, entirely uh, helpful in getting us going with that. Um, the guidelines for access uh, tracks and resource providers, again, the two main ones are the baseline security standards that cover host and service configuration, how you manage uh, patching for uh, vulnerabilities, um, standardizing your configuration, authentication and authorization, making sure that um, you know, administrative access uh, requires multi-factor authentication, for example. Audit logging, we want you to keep your logs and share, you know, there's certain logs that we do want you to share with us. Um, network monitoring and controls, we want those in place. And we expect the cybersecurity group uh, to have access to certain information um, as needed to, to fight incidents. Um, the security standards also do provide uh, some example implementation of controls so that RPs understand what we mean when we say you need to do a certain thing a certain way. The vulnerability management policy um, is the plan that uh, for continuously assessing and tracking vulnerabilities. So we have, for example, within access and across the services that we provide in AWS and, and uh, other systems that are hosted at uh, the partnering sites. Um, we use Qualys for um, vulnerability monitoring and reporting. And then uh, that entire process is tracked. And when we find a problem, we chase it down, we create a ticket, and we follow up with uh, the site that we, that we find it on until things are resolved. So this goes back to, again, the inventory and threat monitoring. We do have an access operations service index. Uh, this is a database that manages non-public operational information. So this is you know, in, inside access information. Um, it collects the, the output from Qualys, from Nagios um, monitoring, and any syslogs that are uh, collected and scanned and uh, analyzed. Uh, it records significant operational events and the status of hosts so that we can look things up to make sure that we're um, explaining for the right reasons that something's down or, or unavailable. Uh, and we've created an online uh, interface uh, for authorized members uh, of the project to look at. We have, as part of the operations, uh, in order to provide recipes for uh, RPs to uh, get their particular services in line with what we're asking for, the integration roadmaps, uh, these playbooks, if you will, include uh, the various steps necessary to hook into the operation service index so that we can monitor them. Uh, an example of the service index page here, uh, you see, yes, we do still have a Kerberos uh, uh, authentication uh, system um, that goes back to the TerraGrid days. Uh, that goes in part, this is just an example, but um, these are some of the services we did carry forward um, because there were particular um, uh, requirements such as trying to uh, track the progress, for example, of researchers as they came in as students and became researchers and then became faculty and then later PIs. Um, people come and go through the ecosystem and uh, we give them back their identity when they when they come back because we'd like to uh, keep track of them. However, the service itself needs to be up and running. It needs to be robust. And uh, so this is an example of where within the service index, we have uh, where each of the uh, instances are, who's operating them, who the primary contacts are, um, is it being monitored by Nagios, and has it been scanned, and when was it last scanned, and so on and so forth. Within cybersecurity operations, the uh, probably the biggest service that is visible to the community uh, of users and access 
is the registration identity and access management uh, system. It's made up of a, a collection of software, including co-managed registry. Uh, we do have the, the Kerberos uh, Terragrid.org uh, realm still um, in which we glue our access IDs and uh, principles and, and uh, initial passwords. Um, this was brought over from Terragrid and through Xseed uh, into access. Uh, we use CI Logon, uh, which is a web standards-based federated logging system that you are, I'm sure, very well uh, connected to if you've uh, been in this environment. Um, and we use Duo multi-factor authentication to ensure that people getting into uh, their PIs allocations or their own profiles uh, are authenticating uh, with a non-reusable uh, authentication mechanism. For vulnerability scanning, we are using Qualys and the management process, as I mentioned, um, when we have a problem, we create a ticket, we follow it down, we take, track it down until we know it's either not a problem or it's been dealt with. Uh, we do have a central log collection so that uh, this is going to feed later into the, um, uh, the federated intelligence systems, but we are trying to do that also so that we can correlate logs and um, find things through automated analysis. And of course, you know, it's going to happen. We hope as little as possible. But for incident response, um, we do have an incident response policy with roles, responsibilities, and communications. And on a weekly basis, the Access Incident Response and Trust Group meets uh, to review threats. Um, the Identity and Access Management Working Group is one that is led by Jim Basney. Uh, Jim, I will rely on you to correct me where I go wrong here and to provide uh, color commentary. Uh, their primary goals were to make sure that in the transition between Exceed and Access, that we had a uh, consistent uh, uh, identity and access management system, that it went as smoothly as possible with as little disruption to research activities, um, and to build a system that we can expand over time uh, to take into account any new resources and new use cases that come up uh, in the entire ecosystem. Um, the working group members included stakeholders from all access tracks. Everybody has to bind into the identity um, and access management system to authenticate users and to make sure that um, when they integrate, for example, their websites that need this authentication for single sign-on, that they're they're doing it in a manner that is consistent with uh, the way it was designed. Uh, we had to go through, uh, and I will say we, the royal we, uh, I will say Jim Basney's group went through an enormous amount of effort, especially in the early months prior um, to September 1, uh, through several rapid rounds of design, review, revision, re-review, uh, and prototype development to, um, before they were able to uh, build what has uh, been a remarkably successful system. Um, remarkable, not because we're surprised that it works. Um, we're just really happy that it worked as well as it did. We, we were concerned. We had, as I mentioned, over 100,000 identities to, to uh, suck into the system. And we had to have a way of, of registering new users uh, who were going to come in. And they come in at any time throughout the year, but they tend to be these uh, typical um, times of the year near academic um, um, milestones, like beginning of new new uh, um, academic years. The fall is a big new registration se season. January 1st is a big new registration season um, when project members come on board and we get a whole bunch of new uh, users coming on board and we need to make sure that they can get on um, link their credentials, create their credentials, get into their uh, allocations, apply for allocations, add people to their projects and, and everything else. So uh, we carried over uh, over 100,000 identities. Uh, to our knowledge, this is the largest known co-managed ingest of identities to date. Um, and all the tracks have a CI logon set up and documentation for integration. So we not only had to set it up, but we had to provide the instructions for how you hook into this. And uh, so, you know, user support for their 
web uh, front ends, storefronts, if you will. The allocations folks coordinated with us because what we provide in registration goes to identify people in the allocations database um, and so on and so forth. The entire infrastructure is managed by the cybersecurity team. And if you're interested in the various parts of that, you can go to identity.accessci.org and look at how that's put together. Um, I will briefly uh, look at the registration system with you here and just to give you a sense of how that works. Uh, part of the goals initially have been to uh, try and avoid running uh, as much as we can. So, you know, in the, in the spirit of don't invent it if you don't have to, um, we had hoped maybe we could even outsource uh, the identities to a common one like ORCID that, that um, many researchers in the field uh, work with. But as we looked into that, we realized that there were use cases that were not satisfied by it and that there were limitations of the service and there were um, possibly some risks and even some you know, people who choose not to participate, who, who can't get an ORCID ID or don't want to or whatever else. And so that didn't work out very well. And we ended up um, building a system that had a solid base, but also flexibility uh, to allow people to use their um, institutional identities to authenticate and uh, get into access. So when you come in, if you've been in an XSEED, um, you could simply just continue with your existing XSEED username and password, um, get yourself registered into the duo if you haven't already done that in, in XSEED uh, and you're off to the races. If you're a new user um, and you have a federated identity from your home institution, many in the US uh, belong to universities that have um, an in common membership and uh, have hooked up um, their institutional identity, for example, Carnegie Mellon SAML, uh, set up um, for staff and employees. Uh, and you can use your institutional identity to come in and link it to an access identity. And if you don't wanna do that, or you don't have uh, a federated identity that you're comfortable using, you can just create your own new access uh, use account. And um, as with the prior XSEED folks, you can create a username, set a password and, and enroll your uh, mobile device in Duo. So again, what does this look like once you're in? Well, um, if you actually wanna to go to your user identity dashboard, which is uh, essentially the front end to the co-managed co registration system, uh, you arrive at CI logon, that's sort of the second column and there are two rows here. The top row is if you're coming in with your access identity, you, you specify as your identity provider, the access CI, uh, formerly XSEED, um, and you put in your username and password, you authenticate to Duo and you land. And uh, alternatively, if you have linked your federated ID, you select your identity provider. In my case, it would be Carnegie Mellon University. I put in, uh, it bounces out to Carnegie Mellon. It authenticates me. Uh, Carnegie Mellon happens to also use Duo. So uh, I then have to put in my Duo uh, authentication for that and I similarly land in my identity dashboard. So what does it look like inside the registry? Well, you know, we, you have to put it together a whole bunch of things to get everything to work. Um, and uh, the simplest part of that is your access ID. There's an edu person principal name. Um, this is a, an identity type that is, for example, used in um, Globus uh, uh, um, for, for authenticating, uh, you've got open ID connect subjects. You've got an official email. We do need some way to contact you if you need to reset your password and so on and so forth. And that goes through a vetting process that involves the user confirming their email. And we also do some um, background checking, especially if somebody comes in and says they wanna change their email, we, we actually go and check that they're um, you know, a viable person in the new organization and so on and so forth. Um, within the uh, co-managed registry system, there are authorization groups. I happen to be an administrator since I help uh, deal with uh, researchers' problems with their identities, but that's all reflected in the groups area. Um, there is a status that is calculated based on the completeness of your records. 
Um, and there are role attributes that are primarily of interest to the allocations folks. Um, among other things, when you create a, an allocation in the access ecosystem, one of the rules is that uh, the PI has to be from a an accredited institution in the United States. And so you know, they need that kind of information. Um, the identities with which you can authenticate include uh, an, an access identity, if you have an access uh, identity itself, um, and any other ones that you linked in. In my case, I've got Carnegie Mellon here, and the one at the bottom, although it's somewhat uh, anonymous, is in fact my ORCID identity. So I could log in with any of those three, and uh, those will be considered acceptable. Um, of the services that are provisioned when you get a, an identity, there are basically three primary ones. There's the Access KDC, if you have an Access ID, Again, Kerbo says before in the target.org uh, realm, uh, you are provisioned in the access uh, database. So this is uh, operated uh, by the allocations folks in a different track. Um, and uh, that's how we know uh, what projects you're a member of um, and where your allocations on the resources are. And for authentication, uh, the co-managed registry uh, also prov is provisions you into an LDAP tree uh, which is accessible by various services through an API. Whew. So uh, on to federated intelligence sharing. So we're we're working with OmniSoc. Uh, I just jump started the the onboarding process of access as an OmniSoc service customer. So uh, now that we have our logs uh, at least identified and collecting in the right place, uh, we are going through the process of understanding how we work with uh, the folks at OmniSoc to provide data, as well as to um, get the instrumentation necessary to provide the right kind of data, and also to learn about what the interfaces and controls are for us to uh, learn uh, what their various automated um, extraction, inf intelligence extraction mechanisms um, provide. And so uh, we're looking forward to, to getting that uh, so that we learn better from the data that's available, uh, who's knocking at the door and who's trying to get in and what kind of uh, angles should we be watching? Because in the plethora of, of uh, services that we're offering, we, we can't just watch it all and hope that we notice. There are several working groups that go across the access ecosystem um, and we're a part of all of them. There are, um, you know, check boxes and everybody's checklist that say, have you done this, uh, you know, security um, element? Uh, and so, you know, we lead the identity and access management working group, but we also contribute to our working group on open on demand. Open on demand is another NSF sponsored project at the Ohio Supercomputing Center. Um, and it provides a web friendly interface to many uh, HPC resources. You log in with a web front end on a browser. And it allows you, for example, to uh, organize your workflows using Jupyter Notebooks or to create a canned application that you want your users to use. And it also has a way of, through a browser, giving you, for example, an SSH terminal that you could use to do the normal interactive command line kind of interactivity with HPC systems. We have a roadmaps working group, again, in the operations group. That's the roadmaps that help the um, resource providers integrate, uh, and there are cybersecurity elements in all of those. The ticket system, uh, we went through a transition to a new ticket, sy ticket system. Uh, we took originally the, the one that had been an XSEED and we uh, kept the same system. We were using RT in that system and we upgraded it to the current version of that software, brought over all the tickets so that we could sustain continuity, but we wanted something that was more robust and modern and uh, we'll be going to, um, well, we actually have started now working in JIRA Service Manager uh, with interfaces that are uh, more manageable and we think will, will work better in the long term. Um, our involvement from the cybersecurity perspective is for um, people who want to report incidents and they might not be users, they might be people out in the community, they may be people elsewhere uh, you know, our users of accounts and systems around the world. And if, if uh, somebody somewhere else says, hey, I noticed some data that looks like, you know, usernames, passwords, or credentials from your system here in the US, uh, 
you know, and they want to report that to us. It has to be open, but it also has to be secure to the sense that there may be sensitive information and we don't want that just open in the ticket system for everybody to look at. So they provided a private space for um, incident related uh, uh, tickets to be managed and a separate interface that allows non-members of the access community to submit those tickets. And uh, so that we worked with them to make sure that was um, done uh, to our satisfaction. In terms of web brand branding um, and just the website development uh, uh, working group, uh, they want a consistency, but for cybersecurity, I wanted to make sure that our web page, for example, the very first thing when you're under stress and you need to report that, you know, maybe your identity has been compromised. Um, I didn't want you to have to search through a whole bunch of uh, descriptive information before you hit that link that says report a security incident. So we made sure that those things were up front and center and that even if you were on a mobile device, uh, you'd see that first. In terms of coordination and outreach, we use Slack a lot in addition to email and, and other traditional uh, workspaces. Uh, Access Security uh, operates its own Slack workspace with uh, private channels um, as needed to uh, discuss sensitive communications. Uh, and that has worked very well for us for several years uh, in, in Exceed and going into Access. Um, we participate in, in several cybersecurity standards groups that you may be familiar with. The uh, Research and Education Federations Group, the Federated Identity for Research Group, uh, and uh, the IGTF that uh, establishes standards for authentication providers uh, for relying parties. Um, among other things, I, am, I remain chair of the America's Grid Policy Management Authority, which is one of the three PMAs that constitute IGTF. Um, in terms of outreach to conferences, we, we participate regularly in PERC at the NSF Cybersecurity Summit, uh, the Internet to Technology Exchange, and we often meet our international partners at supercomputing. Uh, so this is a slide that really mostly just summarizes everything I just said. I won't go through it all over again, um, but we got a lot of work done this year. I'm extremely proud of the work of the group. Uh, I want to put a special thank you out to Jim Basney and his team for really knocking one out of the park with the new uh, identity registry system. Uh, and I, um, it's it really is working remarkably well. And uh, thanks to him, everything else works because everything else hinges on that for um, your access into access. Few uh, lessons learned, maybe relearned or 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 uh, just confirmed, perhaps. Uh, relationship building really is trust building. Um, you can't get anything done in cybersecurity if you don't have buy-in. And um, the only way to do that is to go out and encourage participation, to negotiate um, understanding, meaning, um, help people understand that you're working for them and not uh, just imposing rules on them uh, and why it's necessary to do things. So that outreach and personal uh, relationship management, I find to be uh, especially important um, in a very large distributed project that is expected to keep everything running for uh, you know, the computational science community in the country. Um, Despite the best uh, of, of, of intentions, a federated uh, identity and access management infrastructure, I think, remains rather complicated. Um, no matter what you might try to do to simplify and make things standards oriented, uh, <laughs> mission requirements may confound your design uh, ideals. So you think, oh, well, this would work really great. And then you come down to something like, yeah, but we still need to be able to do this. And we still need to be able to ensure that everybody is, for example, using multi-factor authentication. And that's going to mess with the kinds of things you can put together in a manageable way. And so you, you compromise on some of your, your design ideals to make it work. Um, as I mentioned earlier, outsourcing the ID management to a single external provider, as much as we wanted to try and do that, uh, wasn't going to work. And so we had to to do uh, something to cover all the bases. Um, I will say that multi-factor authentication has been a boon. Uh, it's a bit of a hassle for everybody, but I'll tell you when, when reusable passwords are 
were the primary source of uh, security headaches, um, it really cuts it down when you put it in front of the important things. Um, I think one of the areas that, that maybe confuse some people um, and that we continue to get some questions on is what it means to link your federated ID to a access um, identity, um, that when you're linking it, you're linking it for use in access. So I can only link your other thing to my stuff. It doesn't work both ways. Uh, everybody who's operating their own services and that allows um, other identities to be used uh, has to find a way to bring that into their environment and to link it so that it's acceptable. And so that two-way street, if you want to go that way, I don't know whether that makes it more easy or more confusing, but it's certainly something that we've had to deal with some questions on. And then no matter how well you engineer things, people will come up with new use cases and failure modes that you did not think of. Um, it's amazing. Um, we've been very happy. I was worried that the, the uh, number of tickets we're going to get about getting registered and everything else were going to be higher and more complicated. Um, thankfully, they weren't because the system works really well. But I have found myself confounded by uh, the ways people have come in with a with a problem that I that I didn't expect. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as somebody doesn't get it the right the first time, so they try to re-register, and then they don't get it right, so they try and re-register again, and so we end up with a whole bunch of extra records that we have to sort through to figure out which one is the um, is the one to go forward with and try and build uh, the, their identity correctly with. Um, but it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting area. Um, and then the other thing lesson I would say is, is do the homework up front. Um, work really hard to avoid reinventing the wheel. If you can find another resource, another NSF project that has solved your problem, uh, make an effort to use it first before you invent your own stuff. Uh, you know, the, the classic one in cybersecurity is don't invent your own crypto. Well, I think it's, it goes out to other uh, areas as well. Don't invent your own infrastructure if you don't have to. Um, use the lessons and the good work of others to build your systems on. And, and, and that has really worked for us with the help of Trusted CI, um, with the CI Logon project, uh, in common uh, co-managed registry, um, and other tools that we didn't have to reinvent uh, really, really made this a success. Where are we going forward? Uh, well, we look forward um, to engaging other large projects like the Fabric Network Infrastructure Project to evaluate where we can uh, learn from each other and, and prepare uh, for the cybersecurity future in that uh, infrastructure. Um, we want to make sure that our relationship with Omnisoc uh, gets us uh, a really good uh, functioning security event and incident management capability that involves uh, data oriented uh, insight. Um, and we want to finish up developing and uh, getting our policies ratified, in particular related to information classification, disaster recovery. Um, and we also want to work on um, cybersecurity training and awareness uh, and uh, policies for that. So it's not just creating the training, but how often should you be doing this? And how often do, you, do we expect you to come back and you know, check a box that says, um, you know, you, you've, you've updated your knowledge on this area and we, you can move forward. Um, in terms of operational uh, technology, we want to implement non-user OAuth tokens for inter-service authentication uh, to enable automated workflows that can be trusted. Um, we want to add configuration management tool support for the data, uh, system security baseline. So not just tell you what you need to do, but if we can, for example, um, you know, provide Ansible scripts or uh, you know, puppet configurations that will that you can just absorb uh, into your own local management system, and it will check the boxes for you. We'd like to do that. Um, you know, as with any of the services external that we rely on, like Duo, uh, we you know are looking to renegotiate our license because it is rather expensive um, and. Uh, we did do some research last year to see what we could migrate to if, if we couldn't afford it. And service identity was, was one of the alternatives that we identified. Um, but you know, if you don't have to redo your 
your authentication infrastructure, don't do it. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we'll do our best to, to avoid that, but we are going to be, make ourselves ready to, to move forward if we have to with an alternative. And then one area that I'd really like to, to put more effort into is the training and outreach efforts, use the STEP program, um, and also work with partners such as Trusted CI to uh, deliver uh, cybersecurity awareness and training uh, to the broader community. That's it for me. Um, if you have any questions or comments, I'll welcome them now. Great. Um, while people are typing, I'm going to grab the screen back just to kind of go over some community updates. Um, I think you should be able to see my slides now. So great, thank you. We have so many updates. I had to make our font size smaller to fit it all in one slide, which is great. It's a great, good problem to have. So our next webinar is May 22nd, um, 10 a.m. Central. The topic is DART, Deception Awareness and Resilience Training. And this is with Anita Nikolic. Those of you who have been with the NSF for a long time are probably are familiar with her. She's at the University of Illinois Chicago uh, Center for Global Studies. And then hot off the presses tomorrow, um, CI Compass is hosting a webinar at 11 a.m. Eastern, Verifiable Credentials and Digital Wallets, an overview. And that is a really long URL. So let me grab <laughs> my URL um, that I had ready to go so I can throw it in the chat. So those of you can click on it through that path rather than trying to figure it out. Um, uh, so if you're interested in that, go please go register. And then we've got the NSF Research Infrastructure Workshop. Um, Trusted CI posted an announcement about it. If you're on any of the NSF mailing lists, you've probably seen an, uh, an announcement about it. That's June 27th through the 30th in Washington, DC. Um, there is a, uh, it's a hybrid option though, if you're not a bit able to travel and registration is open. So please be on the lookout for that. EduCause's annual conference is October 9th through 12th. That's in Chicago. And then, uh, again, the Trusted CI Summit, it's coming up October 24th through 26th, um, but we are anticipating there will be events before and after those dates, so we encourage people to set aside the whole week um, just to prepare for uh, what's coming out with the agenda. Um, and then, oh, we've got, thank you, uh, that was very useful in helping understand the access uh, moving pieces. I agree. I uh, With some of the comments you men, uh, made about uh, lessons learned, I was nodding furiously. So <laughs> um, it was a very, um, very helpful um, presentation. So we've I'm got sorry, a question. I felt like I, I, I raced through it. I know I, I knew I had too many slides, but I did want to address one one question. I think Fong mm -hmm. uh, Tao uh, offered some questions back at 11.14. If yeah, I, I was getting to that. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, so we've got a question from someone from the Fabric team um, interested in engaging with access. Is there an open access meeting or an engagement meeting that I can join um, internships? Um, and then on top of that, this is interesting about this intelligence feed that you're looking into. How does someone subscribe to that? So, um, you know, all all three of those uh, questions are uh, are welcome is is contact me and I will I will figure out the right people to talk to if it's not me. Um, in terms of the uh, work back from the, the third one, uh, the intelligence feed, um, I've just started the onboarding process with OmniSoc. Uh, the, the intent is that uh, all partners who are within access uh, should be able to get some level of um, participation into it, not only providing data, but getting some kind of an interface that they can watch to learn something from it. The whole point of this is the, you know, federated is you, you get the, the data from the many and you provide the intelligence to, to the entire community. So as soon as we, as, as I know the answer to your question, I will be happy to share it. Um, there's a question about an open internship call for the fall semester. Um, the current STEP program is underway and the participants for that have been um, uh, selected and it's already kind of on its on its uh, progress going forward. But I would suggest um, talking to Winona Snapchilds uh, about that. 
And um, if you don't have her contact information, it should be somewhere in the slides, actually, I think. I think somewhere. If not, then just um, please send me an email. My email is on the on the first slide. Uh, and I will put you in touch with the folks uh, who can give you answers about internships that are available, because it's not just the STEP program, but I know that each of the partner sites who are resource providers have their own internship opportunities, uh, and you may be able to take advantage of that. Um, the question from the Fabric uh, member, uh, I look forward to talking to you. Um, we would like to understand where you guys are going. And I'm sure that our uh, data networking folks, Kathy Benninger here at PSC, um, and uh, others will will be very happy to to kind of glue us together in the right ways, so that uh, we're working forward not only in terms of practical aspects of of network uh, stuff. We just, in fact, at PSC, we we just got our fabric uh, equipment um, last week, I think. So we look forward to to being hooked up uh, physically, if not uh, it, just organizationally. Um, but in terms of hooking up in, in, with the access program in general, and maybe aligning and understanding each other's needs, uh, I look to get that jump started as, as soon as possible. And um, if you're the right person to talk to, then, then I'll be in touch. Uh, if not, please uh, do let me know who I should be in touch with. Uh, because I'd like to get some meetings or organized to figure out and to, to get that going. Do we have other questions? Last call for questions, gang. All right, well, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, I hope it wasn't too much too fast. Uh, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, to send me an email and I'll be happy to, to answer you um, as as I can. Great. Thank you very much for um, presenting today. Uh, everybody else, uh, when I end the call, you'll be kicked out of the room, but uh, I hope you all have a great day. And I will be posting this video probably later today. So thanks again, Derek. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.